you know, we continue to ask and look for God to do these amazing things in our lives and in our family, and he continues to do so. Um, so it kind of got me, you know, on the ball rolling this morning. You know, is there anything in your life that you need God to do? You know, do you need God to do anything in your life? Lord, I want to thank you for those seven people right now. <laughs> we thank you, Lord, for giving me the holiest, unneedy church ever. We are one heck of a perfect people. Let me ask that question again. Do you need God to do anything in your life? There we go. Sometimes I got to wake you up a little bit. See, there are some things that not only do I need God to kind of intervene in my life, but there are some things that have always been in my life that I need God to do a miracle in. I've learned over my life to look at the small things in my life that God does, even as miracles. You know, we have this tendency to think of, you know, a miracle is, you know, this huge, amazing thing that, that God does, and he does do those. But, you know, down to the smallest thing that we say a lot, and I, I tend to even think about a lot, is the fact that your body works the way it does and your breathing today is a miracle. And so even the small things that God accomplishes in my life that I can't see a way out of, there's those things that, you know, I want to work, I, can, I don't see a way out of, and then God does it to me, that's a miracle. And when we see those things in our life that aren't working out, are we humble enough to say to God, hey, God, I need a miracle here. Today, we meet a man who needed a miracle, a miracle that he would eventually receive, and it's a miracle that would also bring more criticism pointed directly at Jesus. And Jesus, as usual, is all too ready for it. And so I want to kind of take the same format we did last week. If you joined us for week one of this series, we had a, a great uh, a great time of word just kind of looking in. And, and we, this is how we did it. We kind of looked at the miracle. And then we looked at why the, Jesus got criticized for it. And then we looked at how Jesus handled it. I feel very uh, strongly today, uh, this word is very personal, and this word, when, when we see not just the amazing miracle that Jesus is about to do for us to go through today, but when we see what he does with the criticism today, it's something for every single one of you to leave here with today to be encouraged. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is the last gospel uh, the fourth book of the New Testament. I want to welcome those who are joining us on our ever-growing online family. Thank you for joining us today. As usual, the words will be on the bottom left-hand corner. For those of you who need the words here, big font right behind me on the big old screen. John chapter 5, kind of a famous story, kind of a story that uh, maybe you've heard before if you've been around in church, but a story that kind of never grows old. There's just so much in there. So let's start, John 5, let's read verses 1 through 5. Here we go. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five colored colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. I want, you to, I want to point out right there that you'll notice that verse 4 is missing. And in, in most modern translations, verse 4 is not there, but we'll get to that because we're going to go back and look at verse 4 from another translation in a little bit. Let me just explain this scene to you, this pool. So it, this pool, it says it has these colonnades and basically what it if you can imagine a pool and it had these five big columns with platforms on them and they were covered and this is where the people would go the, the bible tells us that people who were sick and lame couldn't walk hurting people people who needed miracles would come and they would lay on these platforms and so Jesus is, it says he's showing up at this time for one of the festivals. Most likely it was Passover. 
And so Jesus shows up. Again, Jesus does things on purpose. He shows up during one of the festivals. Why? Because it would be packed with people. Jesus knows exactly where to go. Our scripture right there tells us that there's a man who's been an invalid for 38 years. Jesus shows up at that time, and he goes right to him. Look at verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? I love the fact that Jesus asked this question. It seems kind of like a dumb question at first, right? The guy's been like this for 38 years. Do you want to get well? Nah, I'm good. I'm good. Go, go to somebody else. 38 years, I'm fine. And so it got me thinking, like, you know, why, why would Jesus form this question to this man? Jesus says Jesus learned that he's been in this condition for a long time, so it's not like he didn't know. Why would he ask the man such an obvious question? And here's, there could be many implications of why, but here's what I come up with, and, and I think it relates to you and I. You see, week in and week out, for you and I, God is speaking to us, whether it's through his word or through prayer. But are you really expecting anything to change? We're always eager for God to change our circumstances, but are you eager for God to change you? Think about how he words the question. Do you want to get well? I bet if I were to ask 100 people what they would want to see God do for them, 99% of this, them would be about their situations. God, please make my husband not be so crazy. God, please stop my kids from acting like the spawn of the devil. Can I get an amen from somebody? God, please get rid of Cindy at work. She's driving me nuts. God, please get me that raise I deserve. Here's the thing. Those are all good things to pray about. But if I were to ask 100 people the question, what they would want to see God do for them, here's the things I wouldn't hear. God, help me with my anger issues. God, help me with my stubborn heart. God, help me to be a better wife. God, help me to be a better husband. If you want to see God do a big change in your life, if you would like to see some revival in your life from the rut that maybe you have been stuck on, instead of always asking God about situations, maybe it's time to say to God, God, set me free from me. And so Jesus didn't ask the man if he wanted to feel better about things. He said, do you want to get well? Sometimes it's easy to feel better. I mean, you could come to church every week to feel better, but never actually get well. This man has been in his dysfunction for so long, it might even feel comfortable to him at this point. You'll see that when the man answers in our next verse, he doesn't actually even answer Jesus' question, do you want to get well? Look at verse 7. The man said to him, Sir! The invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. The man says, sir, he doesn't even know it's Jesus. He says, sir, here's the deal. I don't have any help. Jesus, you don't understand. No one cares about me. Sir, you don't understand. People are always jumping in front of me in life. Sir, most people have abandoned me because of my situation in life. Sir, you don't understand. Life's been really tough, and I have no one. I wonder if Jesus was like, man, I, I didn't ask you all that. <laughs> I just asked you a simple question. You, ever, you're, you have those people in your life? The people you say, you know, hey, good morning. And you're like, oh, boy, here it comes. And you get like the life story. Like, hey, man, how you doing? Now that's just a saying, how you doing? And then you're getting, oh, well, my sciatica is bothering me, my wife, the kids, you know, like, oh, man, I was just trying to be nice. <laughs> this one time I was walking through Costco, 
and because uh, I live at Costco during the week. <laughs> and uh, I was walking through Costco, and I, I saw I saw a guy f- from my older church. He was a friend's father, and um, I saw him. So I started to do the supermarket shuffle. You know what that is? <laughs> when you see that person, and you're like, "All right, if I go down this aisle." We're going to come face to face. So I go buy like bird food or something where I'm, where I, you know, don't think the guy's going to go. And so, and sure enough, no matter where I turn, I knew at some point I would come face to face with this guy. And I came face to face with him, you know, and, and I said, hey, you know, man, how, I even forgot the guy's name. Hey, man, how, you know, how are you? And again, I'm just, I'm just in Costco. Like, I'm just trying to pick up my 38 pound tub of hummus, like, you know. <laughs> And, and I said, you know, hey, you know, how you doing? And he's like, oh, <laughs> I almost died. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, obviously you didn't die. You're here. All right. You know, let's hear it. You know, 63 minutes later, I heard his whole life story, how he almost died, but he really didn't. And so <laughs> I don't know why I told you that story. I just felt like this guy was like laid into Jesus, not knowing that he's Jesus. And Jesus just said, do you want to get well? But here's the problem. Everything the guy said to Jesus is true for him. How many people have passed by this man for 38 years? How many family members have written him off? How many so-called religious people walked by this man, turned up their noses, and didn't even look his way to avoid feeling convicted about seeing him there and needing help. On a side note, let me remind every person in here that you and I are called to be completely different than any of those examples. You and I are called to keep our eyes open and look for the people who need help. But that was the facts in this man's life. What this man doesn't have the privilege to know at this time is something that you and I know now. And that no matter the circumstances that are presented to us, faith overrides the facts of our circumstances every single time. But this guy doesn't know that. I'm sure in this amount of time in this man's life, any faith he had whatsoever of being healed was now probably gone. So he gives Jesus his list of reasons why he can't get well. If you notice, his excuses and his list revolve around other people. I have no one to help me. Everyone is getting in ahead of me. You ever done that? You ever be, you know beating yourself up about something or down about something and you realize you start all the all the reasons and excuses we give have to do with other people but never look in the mirror and look at us jesus asked him do you want to get well you see to understand this guy's response we have to go find that missing verse four and so you'll find this in older translations of the bible and here's uh, john 5 4 here's what it says It explains what happens at this pool. It says, For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. So it seemed at this pool that God would send an angel down to stir up the waters. And when the water stirred up, if you were first to get into the water, you would receive a miracle, some sort of healing, whatever it was you were dealing with. Now, this could be an entire sermon on its own, but I don't, want to, I don't want you to miss this one fact. When God stirs up something in your life, pay attention and lean into it because he's about to do some amazing things. But this, this stirring of the water didn't have like a timetable, it seems. It didn't run by a calendar. It just happened randomly. No exact place or time. And this guy couldn't walk and couldn't have, didn't have any help, so he would always be last to get to the water. He would never receive his miracle. Other people were, who were better off than this man would go and get into the water first when it was stirred up. And other people would get their miracle, but not this guy. Verse 3, when we read in the beginning there, kind of gives us a clue. I, I, I can't really back this up. 
but I just thought it was interesting. I wanted to show you verse three. We read it in the beginning, said, here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed, one who was there for 38 years. So the word used to tells me that maybe there really isn't even many of them there anymore because everyone else had gone in and received their miracle and now they've headed off, but not this one. But Jesus, in his unending grace, goes and finds this one guy. The one person that others would write off. The one who couldn't help himself. The one that would always be last for healing. Jesus comes to him. And what's great is this guy, he didn't have to get any better at life. He didn't go to church more. He, he, just, he just laid there. And Jesus comes right to him and says, I hear you. I hear all the reasons why you can't get in the water. But see, here's a beautiful picture. Here's another thing this guy doesn't understand. This is John chapter 5. In John chapter 4, now Jesus has only done two miracles up to this point. And so he begins as he's traveling around, right? Several verses before this starts, in John chapter 4, Jesus meets a woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And he shows up at the well, and he says, give me a drink. Which, by the way, is not a great pickup line, guys. <laughs> but Jesus gets away with it. He says, give me a drink. And, of course, the woman at the well, she starts in with this whole thing. She's like, why are you even here? We're not supposed to be talking to each other. You're a Jew, and I have no bucket, is exactly what she says to him. And Jesus goes on to tell her, I'm not just talking about that kind of water. You see, the kind of water I'm talking about, we don't need any bucket for. Because Jesus tells her, I am the living water, and all who drink of me will never be thirsty again. So watch this. This is beautiful. So now Jesus is standing over this man, this lame man, who says, he's saying, Jesus, I can't get into the water. Nobody is helping me. Nobody, everybody has written me off. I've been here so long, Jesus. I can't get to the water. And Jesus says, well, guess what? The water has now come to you. Amen. And so Jesus comes to this man because he couldn't get to the water. And now the water has come to him. Look at verses 8 and 9. So Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat, and he walked. Then get up and walk. You see, the man's excuses didn't matter. His miracle happened when he was all out of excuses and let Jesus take over. Essentially, Jesus is letting this guy know, you didn't need the pool, you need me. And the same can go for my life, and the same can go for your life. Maybe, just maybe, it's time to stop giving excuses on what you can't do and let Jesus do what he does. We're always waiting for God to come down to us and change the things we can't. But maybe, just maybe this time, God is saying to you, I'm already here, and now it's time for you to get up. Jesus said to this man, get up. Pick up that dirty thing you've been laying on for 38 years and get up and walk. Think about this miracle for a moment. It says, at once the man got up. 38 years he's been lying on the ground, not being able to move. And at once, the man picks up his mat and walks. 38 years. I can't sit on the couch for two minutes with my leg in the wrong position and it hurts for the next two and a half hours. And God forbid I have to sit on concrete or a hard surface. I feel like I need hip replacement when I get up. Can I get an amen from there? Right, yeah. I ain't the only one creaking and cracking and bones hurting around here. 38 years this guy's been laying down and he immediately picks up his mat and walks away. Look at the rest of verse 9. It says, the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. Let me tell you, that was no accident. 
Jesus knew all too well what day it was. With all of those people watching, nothing in Jesus' ministry was an accident. Verse 10 shows that they noticed this. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. This man was lying on the ground for so long, they know exactly who he was. You know they're aware of his situation. They know how long he's been struggling to get to the pool first because he's been trying for years. They bypass all of that and say, why are you carrying your mat on the Sabbath? These are religious leaders. They should have had their eyes wide open for somebody doing this type of work. They should have been floored beyond comp comprehension by this miracle. And instead, they missed it. I want you to take notice, and I want you to see how religion can blind you from the miracle that might be right in front of you. So now this man's going to give them the reasons why he's doing this. I mean, they asked him a question. Why are you doing, why are you carrying your mat on the Sabbath? Verse 11 through 14. But he replied, this is the man. Now, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow? I like that they call Jesus a fellow, like he's a British guy walking around with a cap and a cane. Oh, well, who is this fellow, mate? That was Australian. I get it right one day. Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus has slipped away into the crowd that was there. But later, Jesus found this man. He found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So this man says to the, to the Jewish leaders, he says, The guy who healed me told me to pick it up and walk. I don't know where he went. Jesus, he, he, this man slipped away. I love this picture of Jesus finding him. Notice it says that the man is now in the temple so after he, he went to worship, this man was healed and he went to go celebrate in the temple. He had his mat with him, he picked up, he had a miracle done in his life and he's going to worship. He doesn't know who Jesus is, Jesus had slipped away. But the Bible says that Jesus went and found him in the temple. Now, there was a time a couple weeks ago when I told you it's kind of okay and it's kind of all right to spit out the Lord's name like this. And it's not in vain because I think this is another one of those situations. I, I picture Jesus again, just kind of leaning on the post like this, all cool, with a swimmer's body, <laughs> blue eyes. He's standing there, and this guy comes walking by, and he's like, Jesus Christ, you know. <laughs> now, now, you can say that. It's, not ta it's really him. I wonder what they said before that, before Jesus was around. What did you say when you got scared? Because you all know, you know, you, that's what you say when you get scared, right? What did they say before that? Oy vey. <laughs> and Jesus did. He snuck up on him around the corner and he gave him some instruction. What does the man do? Look at verse 15. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. He goes and tells the Jewish leaders who were asking, he tells them, it was Jesus who made me well. Verse 16. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. Here it comes. Here comes the criticism. Here comes the persecution. Notice the religious leaders don't have to ask who Jesus is when they hear his name. They're very well aware of what he's been up to. Once they hear that name, they must have been like, oy vey. <laughs> so our miracle today is what actually brings the criticism. So that's the first half of that. The miracle brings the criticism. Now watch this. You might look at this passage and think, man, how crazy is this? The man was afflicted for 38 years Jesus comes by on a pit stop on his way to a festival, and in one question, the man is instantly healed, and the man never answered the question. 
his 38-year affliction. And all the religious people seem to be focusing on is what day he did it on. How can he do that on the Sabbath? I mean, but is it really that odd, though? Have you ever seen someone's life transform by the power and the saving grace of God just to watch people persecute them afterwards? They miss the whole miracle because of a life changed by a relationship with Jesus just to continue to criticize and point out your past to you. I said the same thing last week because it happens over and over again to people. If that's you... If that's you today and Jesus has done an amazing work in your life, you need to know that no matter what anybody says, you are set free. Free from whatever it was that was binding you and free from whoever has anything to say about it. You need to see that even with this man's life change, this incredible, incredible miracle, 38 years in the making, doesn't even answer Jesus's question. I have been like this for 38 years and Jesus heals him and even Jesus is criticized about it. How can you do that on the Sabbath? Well, Jesus will explain it. Look at verse 17. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is also work." is also at his work to this very day, and I too am working. Now, normally, Jesus doesn't defend himself. He doesn't have to. But here, the Bible specifically points out, and it says, in his defense. The next thing he's about to say in is, is his def- this is his defense. And again, we know with Jesus that nothing is an accident, so there must be a reason We have to realize the importance of that statement. I mean, can you imagine, can you really fathom what that statement just did? Jesus puts himself in line and equal with God, who he just referred to for the first time as his father. He says, my father is always working, so I'm always working. I see someone hurting and I work. I don't care what day of the week it is. Jesus said, my father and I, we both work any time we please to heal and set people free whenever we feel like it. So Jesus takes this criticism. The miracle brought the criticism, but the criticism brings the message. And it's an important one. The message from Jesus to them is this. I am the son of God. And now, things are about to change. Look how applicable those words are from Jesus for for you and I on this very day. He says, my father is always working. And to this very day, so am I. So how do these religious leaders take this news? Verse 18 says this. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So the miracle brings the criticism, but the criticism brings the message. And Jesus took their criticism and he turned it into his message. He says, I'm here and I'm the son of God. And here's what I feel God is saying to me and you today. If God has done a work in your life, if God has healed you from the inside out, if God has changed you in ways that make others criticize your faith, then do like Jesus did. Take your miracle, take your story, take your changed life, take your story of how you felt redemptive grace And do like Jesus did and turn it into your message. It's time to shout it from the rooftops of what God has done in your life. Why would we want to be silent about that? Why would we want to keep that quiet? The the story of God, this this beautiful picture of what God can do in your life, what a relationship with with Jesus can do in your life, doesn't just spread through preaching. It doesn't just, just spread through church. It spreads from you telling others, you may not believe this, but here's what happened in my life.
So what's your story? What's your testimony? What has a relationship with Jesus done for you that could only be classified as a miracle in your life? Don't be like this man. In verse 13, this man, when they asked him, who did this? How did you get this way? How did you get healed? Do you remember his response? I have no idea who healed me. Well, guess what? When it comes to our lives, you and I know who it is. There are things in my life that are absolutely no way it could have been anything else but God's divine hand over my life. And I know who it is. And you know who it is. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what changes you and I. Let that be your testimony. And if that's not your testimony, if that's not your story, let today be the day that that changes. Because you have a story to be told. You have a story that is not finished yet, that is yet to be revealed. I know some of you may feel like you're just so down. Maybe it's not 38 years like this guy today. Maybe it hasn't been that long. Maybe for some of you, it's been longer. And maybe you're just stuck in that rut and stuck in that rut and can't get out. And you feel like, I'm, I'm useless. I, I, don't even have, I don't have a story to tell because I'm still struggling with stuff. That's the best story out there right now. The best story out there right now is someone who's sitting here today that is still struggling with something in their life, but they're watching God work in their life. That's the best story to be told right now. So I ask you again, what's your story? And if you don't have one, let today be the day that you begin it. Ask Jesus into your heart. It's, it's, not, it's not some magical thing. It's not some, some big steps you have to take. It's as easy as sitting there and say, God, I'm a sinner. God, I can't get out of my own way, and I don't know what else to do. And Jesus says, you just stand in there waiting. He's been waiting your whole life to have a relationship with you. He's just waiting for you to invite him in. Invite him in today. Say, say a silent prayer in your heart and just say, Say, God, I, I, I believe, to the best of my ability, I believe that your son is real and I believe that he died for my sin and I want to let him into my heart for the first time today. Say that prayer. Don't leave here today without saying that prayer and opening your heart because it's your story that somebody else needs to hear. Somebody, think about that, somebody needs your story to help better their life. Don't leave here today without knowing that you have a story to tell and that God's hand's been all over it. It's time to shout those stories from the rooftop. It's time to have a testimony that will change other people's lives and change this world. Let that be your testimony this morning. Would you stand?